thank you for joining today. Um, I just want to know, like, how many men in a room, like, can you just, like, I think it's, I was guessing like a dozen, but maybe less, right? I thought this impressive because I've been to so many events, so many tech events with absolutely the opposite sometimes. Um, so I think it's great that they were able to bring like so much um, women in the room today. And thanks also for having some, some men joining. Um, I want also to emphasize a little bit on the fact that they bring so many amazing women today. So I have like five in, in the panel. Um, I know this is very challenging. Um, and I've organized some events before, and you, you need to invite women. It's very, very difficult. Um, there's not that many at this level. Um, I have some numbers to later to mention that. Um, but the change is like a lot of women are doing so many things, so it's very difficult to have them. Um, so it's why I, I want to say thank you for joining us today. Um, so like maybe we we'll just start with like one or two minutes each of you to just introduce yourself, what you do uh, in your in your companies, and uh, yeah. Okay, I'm Susan Jen. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Asia Pacific for IBM. And um, based in the US, but I've been in Asia for a total of about nine, nine years, and it's the best place on the planet. <laughs> Particularly Singapore, may I add. <laughs> Ta, everybody. I'm uh, Sunita Kaur. I'm the Managing Director for Asia at Spotify. I'm Michelle Simmons. I'm general manager for Microsoft's Southeast Asia New Markets. So I'm responsible for consumer and commercial business in nine countries in Southeast Asia. Hi, I'm Nopra Yokubon and I'm with Google. I work a lot with um, apps and game developers to help them scale up their business. Hi, good morning. My name is Rosanna and I'm a lead business analyst in ThoughtWorks. So what I really do is a lot of talking, um, mainly to ThoughtWorks being a consulting company, I talk to the clients, what are your requirements, what do we need to build, and I talk to the developers, this is what we need to build, so I bridge the gap, and mostly I hope to share to you guys today is really um, just, just to share a bit of an information. Um, I worked in the tech department um, for, 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 for all my career, but actually didn't graduate with a, with a tech degree. So, um, so that, and um, another thing is like, uh, I'm a mother of two with one infant, so I guess, you know, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to share with you, if, if you can pick up anything on that, you know, if I can help on that area. Amazing, thank you. So the thing is, I mentioned before, when we look at leadership, in a, I check on all your companies, uh, how many women on the boards of your companies, right? Um, so usually it's between two to three, uh, women on board of each of those companies like IBM, Microsoft, Spotify, even if Taft work. So Taft work, I just look at the C-level because there's no board. I mean, it was difficult to find. It's not a listed company. And Spotify, it was quite interesting because they're maybe planning to go for an IPO. And recently, they just bring like two women on the board. And before, it, wa it wasn't any woman on the board, apparently. Um, so this is interesting when you just look at the board level. But when you look at uh, some numbers, so for example, um, I found for... Uh, Taught work because they got an award recently, so they, they, they really describe how many women at each level. So if you look at overall in the company, it's 40.5% of women. So you are close to the 50-50, right? But when you go to mid-level, is 46.2%. And then when you look at senior level, is only 30%. And when you go to executive level, is 23.8%. So the higher you, you go, the less women you have in the organization. Uh, it's the same thing with Alibaba. So Jack Ma was also very supportive of women, but it's the same thing on his organization. And I think he get only one woman on his board, so it's less than, <laughs> than any of those companies today. So my question would be like, what, what would be your advice for women to be able to take those leadership roles and, and be able one day to reach this kind of C-level or, or board of those companies? Like, how can we see more women going to uh, those positions? Okay. <laughs> well, we do have a female CEO. Yeah. You, you, you are the only company. IBM is the only one here, um, and across the four, five hundred, there's like um, around like twenty, thirty companies with a female CEO. But yeah. IBM you, is true. You see the pictures, and there aren't very many. One thing, you know, um, she just did a very unusual interview that I would refer people to with Steve Kramer, where she talked about her personal life and her challenges, and it's really very inspiring when you look at someone who's come to the level of CEO and. Um, she came into being the leader of IBM in a period of time where the business suddenly became very challenged. And a lot of it was personalized to her. Um, but 
watching her has been really inspiring to me because, and she talks about, you know, what helped her to do that and what she brought out of inside her, which is basically not to let people characterize you as what they think you are, but to be who you are and be authentic and genuine in yourself. And I think that's, in the, you know, that's, was very inspiring to me even to, um, and I wanted to share that. Okay, so, um, so you mentioned ThoughtWorks, right? So ThoughtWorks, um, we do have a CTO, CTO that is female, that's Rebecca Parson. So we're quite proud of that fact that our CTO is a female. And here in Singapore, um, our MD, who's actually sitting there, is Jessie. So she's, uh, so um, she started, uh, she, she became the MD last year, right? So uh, personally here in Singapore, for me, being um, employed in Singapore, I was like, yay, a female MD. And apart from that, the, the um, Asia Pacific uh, MD, who's Ange, is also a female. So uh, compared to the other uh, previous companies I've worked for, I would say like ThoughtWorks is doing much better in that aspect. So that's a very, very, I'm personally very happy about that. But speaking generically, um, I do see that um, the stats that uh, you mentioned, they're very, very true. And um, so how do we, you know, how do we solve that problem? I guess it's a very, very complicated problem that, uh, that we should tackle both um, in, in many different ways. So personally, from my experience, um, when I was really, really young, just starting out my career, right, I've never really felt the difference of men and women in the workforce because I was single and I didn't have a family. I'm like, what do you mean, like, equality in the workplace? What's it? Like, I feel totally fine. I don't feel any difference with my male colleagues, but things have changed. My first, um, my, my, f uh, actually, the, 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 f the ch main change that I felt was really when I had children. Um, when I got married, little difference, but when I had children, it's like um, I had a male boss, and, and after I came back to mater from maternity leave, I was like, you know, I'm really looking for a, a, a woman mentor, somebody that I can talk to about the, the, the challenges that I'm facing. And him being a, a, ma a male, my male boss, he was really, really, really supportive, but he was not able to, um, to understand a lot of the things that I'm experiencing. And that was like an aha moment for me. Like, you know, this is, this is that's probably why um, at the, you know, the entry level, maybe it's 50-50, men and women, but as, as women age, you know, because they are, you know, they are further down in their, uh, like, uh, like, like they have st start having families, they start having kids, and they have a lot more to juggle. That's when they start, you know, opting out of the workforce. So t for that problem, there are both internal and external um, uh, forces at play. So internal, you know, they did mention that um, being, uh, there's the imposter syndrome, if, if you look at, you know, how many female leaders they are, it's like, oh, who do I aspire to? Not much, so that's an internal problem. External problem as well, like, because of these changes, uh, because, for example, now you, you have children, there's, you finally realize that society expects very different things from you as a woman or you as a man. So, and you suddenly realize, oh, there's so much more responsibility. So there are also external factors that need to be addressed to make the, um, I guess, you know, the expectations more balanced for men and women. So, so it's a very intricate problem, and I believe that in general, our society is both, uh, our society um, changing the external factors and really helping women with the internal factors, it's progressing, but it's not something that happens overnight. So it's a long process, and we have to continually do it again and again. We may not all of a sudden see a lot of changes, but we have to pursue so that, you know, at the end, we finally reach equality that we we're aiming for. I would add, um, speaking specifically about why we don't see more women at the board level in the C-suite, I think that one, one of the things that Susan talked about earlier um, is how women actually speak to the, the opportunities, their, their business life, their work life, and the challenges at that level. And so I think there are more and more women who are speaking out and, and sharing those stories. Um, we also ha we have a female CFO, Amy Hood, and she's also very open about the challenges that she faces, about balancing um, uh, work and the demands of work with her family life. So I think that that's a good uh, start in the right direction. Um, but I also think that um, earlier in the career, 
if women aspire to that level, we need to be very thoughtful about the types of career choices that we make. And I think that's often not part of the discussion. It's typically a male-female diversity discussion, but there's also, if, if we are aiming for C-suite, there's typically a need for diverse, diversification of experiences as well that comes into the discussion. Um, I think just to, to, to pick up on, on one word, which was, which was balance. I think, you know, balancing anybody's life is, it doesn't matter what, what gender you are. And we are <clears throat> at, a, at a point uh, professionally, just as a, as a world, where conversations are changing, and I think taking gender off the table is incredibly important. Um, I'm not saying women use a lot of things as an excuse, but when you can balance things out uh, as an individual or as, as a company, that's very, very important. And one thing that I've definitely learned at Spotify, which really helped to do that, I mean, you know, working for, for 22 years, I can't remember when we didn't talk about gender inequality. Um, but what we did at Spotify about two years ago is we changed that conversation, not from a woman's perspective, but from a man's perspective. And the first step we did was uh, we extended six months maternity leave and also applied six months paternity leave. And I very recently had a, a, an interesting conversation with um, our head of strategy and operations, who's a guy and just had uh, a little girl and sat with me and, you know, almost basically was quite uncomfortable with the fact that he had to take six months off work. And so with that conversation changing, it, it evens out the playing field and it evens out uh, the conversation and the balance, and I think that's where the next generation needs to needs to take that. I think this is very interesting because there's several companies who are looking to also offer the same um, duration for men and women for uh, paternity or maternity leave. But I think there's some numbers already on some companies where they found out that even if they're offering, very few men are really taking it, or they would just take a small part of it, or none of it. So how can we really encourage? Because I think it's maybe also some social pressure. For a man, like if you're a man with a, um, a baby in the street and, and people see you like every week, that kind of the thing you don't work, right? They don't think you're an apartment leave for six months. So they may get some social pressure from their friends, etc. So how can we also encourage like this side? How can we see like more men doing those kind of things? Yeah, it's interesting you say that. My husband stays at home. He's been at home for nearly 14 years. So he faces um, that, I think, that perception. We lived in Korea for three years where stay at home um, father is basically unheard of. Um, so I think there are some social pressures, but at the same time I would argue if men choose not to take that time, you know, when I took, I had three children within 39 months, um, and so that was a lot of maternity leave in a very short period of time, but I chose to, because of that, to go back to work as at 12 weeks um, for each of those. That was my choice. Other people at Microsoft took more time. Um, and so I think that we need to enable um, men and women to make those choices, but make those available and also make them acceptable um, in the workplace. And so there's societal aspects, um, as I mentioned, uh, that I think stay-at-home men do face, but there's part of um, the more the more men that you do have taking paternity leave, staying at home, you start to change those, those dialogues. Uh, what I would add to the conversation around, you know, like men and women in office, I think it all coming back to how, how do we change it? It's, it's starting with, you know, having sponsorship and having mentor and having strong culture within the company to be supportive. And, and I think, like, you know, all of us can be advocating for, um, you know, like, men, women, and just, but, but not try to bucket people into, hey, because you're a mom, or because you're, you know, you're, you're a girl, or you're a man, and then you start clouding your judgment. I think it's all going back to looking at the quality of people work, and um, 
being supportive of one another and advocating for the cause that having diversity at your table helps the company make better decisions, help the company you know, like have stronger cultures, being more inclusive in your leadership. I think that's very, very important when it comes to company culture that allow us to, to do that and allows all individuals to, to, thr to thrive. And, and I think also, I mean, today the discussion is about a lot about women, but when we talk about diversity, it's like far beyond only women. It's yeah. about age, it's about politics, it's about uh, LGTB, et cetera, right? Yeah. And I think at Google also, they have like some specific benefits sometimes based on, also like LGTB can have some specific benefits that maybe other people don't have. Not because they want to discriminate, but because they want to offer what people need. So I think this is also very important about this inclusion yeah. on, on the company. I think ex exactly, because, you know, there's uh, different groups in, and um, when we approach and we think of our employees. And uh, recently I, I helped one of my uh, team member who was going through his, now her, <laughs> his discovery. And it, it's not easy, you know, this is, you know, it's not going through traditional life and uh, having, having uh, a family and then having a baby, but that's also a different type of diversity. And by being inclusive, then you encourage your employee to be happy. And when they're happy, they just contribute more. And, and creating that kind of environment where you allow people to be themselves and to bring their true self to work, I think it's very, very important. Yeah, I, th I think also when, when you look at the um, unicorns who have been built in the US, they mentioned like 51% of them have at least some foreign founders. So I think it's also quite interesting really to have like this diversity. And, and I mentioned it's, it goes beyond like just women and men. Um, I know like all of the companies um, are doing things to uh, promote diversity and inclusion. So three out of the five today, um, it's really the listed one, have a section about diversity and inclusion on their HR page. Uh, for Spotify and Tout work, it's more about on the blog. There is some mention on, on those points. So what do you think you can do to support like more diversity or what your orga organization is doing to support more diversity and inclusion um, at your office? I think the culture point's a really important one, and, and we tend to think of culture as being either driven by the organization or driven by the leadership, and those things are there, but you know, to your point, we all create the culture. And one thing that made a remarkable change um, for us in IBM was moving from, um, uh, moving from um, cubicles to a totally open space. And that includes everybody. So it was a little uncomfortable for me at first to sit th at this long table that included, you know, people two, three, four levels below me, um, administrative assistants, et cetera. But the change was remarkable. I mean, once you get over the fact that you can't talk too loudly or the Italian guy, you know, has an annoying accent, um, but it, it, it changed the way we work and everyone's opinion becomes part of, you know, that becomes the culture. We create the culture, it's not given to us. And that's when things really start to happen and the creativity and the personalities and all of that actually make it much more than when everyone's sitting in their, you know, little space on a headphone. I, I would add one of the things you know, Microsoft has had a commitment to diversity and inclusion, but one of the things that we've done over the last couple years is focus on unconscious bias. And I know there are a number of companies that are, that are doing that, because then you start to really um, understand, not just, uh, too often I think diversity and inclusion becomes a numbers discussion, um, which doesn't actually change behaviors. Um, it doesn't change the way, it doesn't change one's thinking. And so by fo focusing on unconscious bias, we actually start to break down um, uh, your, your, your thinking that you may not be aware of. What are you bringing to work? What are you bringing to your team, your organization, your workspace, um, both positive and negative? And it was interesting. I was just talking to someone at Microsoft last night, a, a coworker, and he was mentioning, he said, I thought it was, there was a picture in the news um, and it had uh, President Trump, and it had uh, the CEO of Apple, the CEO of Microsoft, and the CEO of Amazon. And his perspective, not being an American, was how incredible is it to see a gay CEO, a foreign CEO, 
And also another CEO who has you know, a, a, a different background as far as um, ethnicity. And I didn't think of that at all. Coming from the US, I'm a US citizen, my bias was just, oh, look, there's some technology leaders meeting with President Trump. And, and so it was interesting, his, so not necessarily a bias, but the perception based on what I grew up with versus what he grew up with, he was more in tune to that diversity sitting at that table. Yeah, and I think I love the, the thought of you know, diversity not being a number and just hiring the best person for the job. Um, and one thing that's, that's definitely on, on our minds at Spotify, for, for us, diversity is, is the generation gap. Uh, you know, you've got, you know, people like us who, I mean, I haven't, you know, had my own office since like 1996. Um, and, um, but then you've got this whole wave of, uh, of, of a workforce that's coming in that doesn't want to be at their desk at nine o'clock in the morning, which I struggle with, right? Because I'm just, you know, eight o'clock at my desk, you know, I clock my, my hours, my day's very structured. Um, and everyone's like, well, you know, I'm gonna come in at 10.30. And, uh, but it's, it's, that, it's that sharing, it's that sharing of different generations. And again, you know, when, even when it comes to performance reviews, which I know is like a ooh, but my generation's very, very used to very structured, once a year, I will sit down with you, I will judge you, and I will tell you what your next year is gonna be like. And I remember when, when I first started at Spotify four years ago, there was massive pushback on that, where everybody, I mean, the average age um, at Spotify is about 23. So I got massive pushback saying, you cannot sit there and tell me once a year how I'm doing. And I thought, I think that's really fair. So, you know, in, in our Asia office, it's immediate feedback. We've got two development talks uh, a year. And so by the time we have our review, there's so much, you know, data to, to fall back on, and it's a very healthy conversation. And so that whole diversity with age is where we both, or three of our generations can, can learn from each other. You, you mentioned like you, when you are here, you are focused on finding the right person, right? But when we look at numbers like HP, I have a, a studio about that, like a man may apply for a job when he don't necessarily have all the skills. So, and he maybe own only 60% of the skill he will apply. Women will wait until they reach 100% of the skills, right? So the thing for your job, you may get maybe more men than women applying. So even if you select the best person, but sometimes I feel like recruitment could be a bit passive. You just put the job offer and you wait for people to apply. But how can you find also maybe other top talent who can allow you to have like maybe a more diverse uh, range of choice? Um, so I, I have a, a team that is uh, fairly diverse and I've actually sought out people who, um, and there's a number of women who uh, in my organization who perhaps didn't have the 100% of the skills um, but they were bringing something unique to the table to add to the diversity and thinking within the team. And so I do think it requires, um, from a hiring manager perspective, from an MD perspective, to actually be looking at the whole organization and having discussions around talent and being thoughtful about seeking out um, people who bring different skills, who um, can, can question. That's one of the things that I'll often ask um, new hires to do is to challenge the thinking. I've been at Microsoft 16 years. I want people to challenge how I'm thinking about the business. Um, of course, in a respectful way, um, but I want them to challenge my thinking and others' thinking. And I think that's a great thing that new hires bring. And so I actually seek that out. So how do you do that in Asia, getting people to challenge you? Because, for example, I went, I, I'm from Europe, right? So French, we challenge a lot. Um, when, when I was a student in China, professor didn't expect us any questions, right? You go in the US, people are expecting asking questions. So how do you get in Asia people coming and challenging you? Yeah. Um, 
It, it is difficult, um, but I think it's, it's seeking out specific feedback from individuals, um, providing opportunities for them to perhaps work on projects or to give feedback to others. So it requires a lot of different um, approaches in order to do that. And I do think, and it's a generalization, I hate making generalizations, but um, in Asia, one tends to rely more on their expertise. And so um, bringing them in to challenge based on their expertise, I've found also successful. Um, I've got a few points to, to add on that. On, uh, I think it's really important to be intentional about your hiring. So um, I've been at Google for a little over nine years and have my fair share of hiring people to the company. And the hiring process that we have is not the hiring manager interviewing the person and then say, hey, you go ahead and we'll, we'll go with you. But uh, we're actually putting together a panel of you know, a diverse interviewer on the, on the panel. So we have you know, someone from the, the function, someone from cross-functional, cross and we're looking at different dimensions from you know, can they do the job to will they fit the company culture. Do they have the uh, leadership skills that we're looking for? Because we're not hiring someone to be in that box forever, but someone that can grow with the organization. And I think also looking out for, I love you know, looking out for all, all of those unconscious bias. And I think when you hire people, just think, is this person best for the job? And sometimes when you're thinking too much about gender, you can also fall in the trap of being very you know, positive discrimination and hiring people when they're coming in and then think, oh, am I your diversity trophy? So <laughs> that's, you don't want to get into that. So it's all about hiring the best people for the job, but giving people equal chance to be successful in the company by stripping out all of your biases and giving people equal footing to, uh, to you know, allowing them to be successful. And uh, on how to build uh, culture and, and how to actually encourage people to speak up. So at different points, and I'm actually from Thailand, but been in Singapore for about 10 years. Um, I've had different um, people from different nationalities on my team. Um, and it's, it's very colorful. And <laughs> the type of conversations that we've had on our team, you know, I've had Filipino, I have all of the Southeast Asian nationalities, uh, some, you know, French, Lebanese, uh, from the US, Malaysia, um, and all, all over the, the place, Australian, Dutch. And when you put everyone on a table, then you can notice, hey, the Asian were very quiet. And if you hire, if you manage to hire the, you know, the introverted Indonesian one, or the in introverted Asian one, they're even more quieter. Or the Japanese one, they'll discuss between themselves first before they you know, hand over the official point of view. So, um, so I think it's uh, then, well, I'll get it later. So then it, I think it comes back to if you are the one leading that organization or leading that team, are you providing people with, uh, are you being conscious and aware of the types of, you know, how people process information, how people think, uh, how people make decisions? And if you know that you have a mix of introverted and extroverted on the team, they make decisions differently, then create an equal playing field. Let them know the agenda way in advance so that they can form their opinion and come to the meeting prepared. And not let the extroverted just take over the meeting. <laughs> and then call people out when they talk too much and then allow the other person to talk, but don't call them on the spot if you know their, their you know, preferences. And uh, I think the other point that's extremely important is people are not going to speak up if they don't feel safe. Psychological safety is probably the most important thing that you want in your culture. People will not speak up. People will, you know, if they, if they feel that they might be retaliated, if they feel that, hey, if I give feedback to, you know, like someone on this table and, oh, my career will be in jeopardy, they're not going to speak up. So uh, I think it's all about going back to then, you know, are you, are you walking, um, walking the talk? If you welcome feedback, if you want them to, and I think people, people know if you're genuine or not. And if you're being authentic and you know that, uh, and they know that you have the best intention of taking the feedback and making their lives in a company better, they'll speak up. So um, I want to um, touch on two things from the perspective of ThoughtWorks. First is um, in terms of hiring. Um, so in ThoughtWorks, we really try to, do, uh, to get creative with our hiring process. So instead of the traditional interviews, oh, you know, look at your CV, oh, tell me about this experience, how about this one? Um, instead of doing that question and answer, we do, 
you know, your job, mostly you will be doing this. How about we do it together? Let's simulate it. Let's do it together. Let's pair. That's when we really are able to tell, you know, how that person will potentially do in a job. As opposed to somebody who really, you know, just practice, you know, these are the, I, I looked at Glassdoor, these are the potential questions, and then uh, I've nailed them down. But really, you know, that person may not necessarily be able to perform the job. He just really, he or she just really, you know, prepared for the question. So that's vastly different. So we really try as much as possible to, to do things together, to do case studies. And um, we have quite a lengthy, uh, like, interview process. Lengthy not in terms of, like, it's uh, harrowing again and again, but we really try to get to know the person. So, you know, it's, uh, during hiring, it's not really just, um, the potential um, employee putting the best foot forward, right? It's also the company, right? We want to show that we are really, we are a really good company, and you know, here's how our marriage might work, right? Because it's it's a marriage, you know, you know, the the empl potential employee with the company both have to be happy. But it, it has to fit together. It has to be that chemistry. So, on both sides, we want to get to know each other. So, so that's for the hiring and. In terms of diversity, right, one of the things I really love about ThoughtWorks is that um, diversity is not just on our blog. We really um, celebrate diverse, diversity in such a way that, you know, uh, for example, uh, there's the uh, Pig Knot event that's coming up in July 1. Although, you know, um, Singapore government has been strict that this year uh, you cannot, um, yeah, PR, yeah, PR in Singaporeans only, you, um, foreigners cannot attend. You know, our office, before that, um, that was announced, our uh, ThoughtWorks Singapore has really, really been excited to be part of this one, uh, for, th for this event. But the fact that they, they made that um, restriction uh, this year, a lot of the employees were really, really sad that they couldn't join. Um, so let's say, you know, how about let's do work around, let's do some sort of mini party before the event. Um, so, um, so even when we're not officially allowed to join the event, there's a lot of things going on you know, as a workaround to still celebrate diversity, just very specifically, we had two sessions of Ask Me Anything, where um, in the first session, there was an openly gay person, like, really ask me anything. So in, in the office, right? pigeonhole, you know, you can ask me anything about my experience being a gay man, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, com if, if you compare that to other companies who say, yes, we like diversity, but that's about it. You know, we put posters, you know, we, we, we send newsletters. But this one is like, Technically, the Ask Me Anything session is not really anything related to consulting, to technology, right? But, but we do it in the office because we really, you know, we celebrate diversity. It's really important to us. It may not be directly related to, you know, your client, your, you know, how you do your coding, but we celebrate the, the you know, different people um, in our office and we really want them to feel and understand, uh, to feel uh, safe and understand each other. So, so, that, so that's the, um, just, just wanted to really share uh, the events that we're planning for at Pink Dot. Okay, I, I will ask my last question for today. Um, Jack Ma mentioned recently that the secret source of Alibaba is having a lot of women. Um, and he mentioned like, because women kind of care, they don't only care about themselves, but they care about their family, they care about other people, um, which means like a lot of things to do. So my question would be, how do you balance your work and, 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 and personal life um, how do you manage, I mean, your kids, you just mentioned like you're traveling a lot. How, how do you do that, right? Mostly imperfectly. Um, but, but recognizing that and living with it, uh, before we were talking about, I, I had a business meeting once where the nanny failed to show up, so I just took my daughter with me on a plane to Boston. And those were the days when you could do that. Um, she still remind me that I missed three of her birthdays in a row because I had a meeting that was always the week of her birthday. But on the other hand, she's lived in five countries and she's traveled around the world. And she, she you know, I, you, you get the balance from the feedback from other people and um, you do the best that you can and be authentic about it. And in the end, um, you'll probably be terrific. I think, uh, yes, there's, there's a lot of chat about, about this because, you know, women come across as having a bit more empathy, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But um, as I think back on, on, on Spotify, I do admit I'm about 80% manager, 20% mama bear. Um, but it's just, it's, that's who I am. And so across my entire life, whether it's my family or work or you know, other things that, that make up my life, it's, it's my life, just like 
any other human being. And it's the same with, um, with lots and lots of guys that I know where they've got their families and they've got work and they've got other parts of their lives as well. And I think, again, it goes back to, um, to leveling that, that playing field and, and you know, to, to your point about you know, men tend to you know, go for jobs where they may be 80% qualified and women feel like they, they need to be 100% qualified. I stopped doing that 15 years ago. And my philosophy has been fake it till you make it. So you, because there will be so much that will get you in through the door. And then as you learn on the job, and everybody learns on the job, that's going to get you to that 100 and then that 120%. And maybe on this point, I will say, usually try to skip the HR, go to the hiring manager. Maybe the one able to understand the, what you can do, even if you don't have done the same job at the competitive company uh, before. Uh, for me, I'd say uh, first is prioritization. I prioritize those things first that are most important. Um, so whether that's working out first thing in the morning because I'll never get to it if I wait till the evening, or whether that's, um, you know, I, I tend to work uh, hard during the week and I try to focus uh, weekends on family time. But the second thing I would say um, is I'm unapologetic. So um, I think you said imperfectly, and certainly all of us are imperfect, and I'm not apologizing for that. <laughs> so if I uh, can't do something from home, or there's, there's something that I'm not able to do because of my travel schedule or whatnot, I mean, my kids are resilient, and um, they tend to understand. I've, you know, I grew up with my father traveling Monday through Friday. I've traveled the majority of my career. And, um, and you figure out how to balance it, and I don't um, beat myself up for it. Uh, while I don't have kids, but I have witnessed um, an amazing you know, like group of uh, female leaders within my, my company. And I've, I've had uh, some as my mentor and sponsors. And I think it's it just I'll, I'll touched on two things. One is discipline and being very you know, like structured in how you choose to spend your time and getting your priority right. So if you can't travel on your you know, ch child's birthday or you, know, uh, you can't get a nanny, so being uh, forward about that, I think the team will adjust around you. They are a supportive uh, network. Um, and so, so being you know, very disciplined in your priority. And the other one is um, on... Uh, the imposter syndrome, which I thought was touched on multiple times. So the research says that about 70% of people, regardless of gender, have experienced that at least once. And it's just how you cope with it. And I think what happens is you start, when you start having self-doubt and you're not you know, recognizing that you get the success that you get because you earn it, and you start thinking, oh, you know what, like, it's, it's, it's just luck. I'm, it's just like someone gonna find out I'm fraud. And when you start going down that route, it spiraled down. I think I spent my first four years thinking I'm gonna get fired. At the end of every year, I was like, oh, they promote me again? I, I'm so gonna get fired, they're gonna find out. And I think at some point you need to stop doing that because if you keep doing that, you just spiral down. So find your support system and um, believe in yourself. And if and when you have uh, doubt, Shut down the success that you've done, validate yourself, uh, and use that as an extra push to then say you prepare more. You, you, know, you know more about the subject and you put your hands up for opportunity. All right, for me personally, um, work-life balance is something that's very close to my heart. Um, I, I, feel, uh, I feel for that topic almost every day, well, like literally every day. So, um, so how it is for me right now is, uh, I'm actually technically based in um, Thailand right now, but my family is in Singapore. So to, to balance both sides, I travel. Monday to Friday, I'm in Thailand. Saturday, Sunday, I'm here in Singapore with my family. And it's very important to me for, for me to be here in Singapore every weekend because I have two kids, one being just 11 months old. And I'm also breastfeeding. So every, every Friday slash Saturday, very early in the morning, actually, um, 
bring a, a big pack of frozen breast milk for my baby because you know I want to give the best for my baby. It's <laughs> so like <clears throat> I'm gonna do this, not gonna fail as a mother. So, um, so I often get that question like, how do you manage to do do, do that? Aren't you exhausted? The short answer is yes, I'm exhausted, very, very exhausted. And um, there is no magic pill answer to say, oh, if you do this, if you do this, here, here are the tips, everything will be fine. So it helps that I really, really enjoy my job. So when I am in Thailand, you know, I am there 100%. I, I'm enjoy, I enjoy what they're doing. I get, my, I get fulfillment out of it. And when I'm in Singapore, I get, you know, I try to maximize the time with my family as much as possible. But be, that being said, it's, again, it's not one perfect answer. Say, just follow this one, everything will be okay. I have good days and I have very, very bad days as well. And exactly what they're saying, you know, if you have a bad day, just, you know, maybe give it a, you know, give, give a good cry and then pick yourself up, do it again tomorrow and, you know, find strength from the things and the people you love and just power through. And in the end, you know, hopefully everything will work out fine. And then, you know, yay, I've made my family happy and my career as well. Yes. So, so there, there's no um, one straight answer. Um, it's something that, you know, continually we have to balance again and again. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you so much. Um, wow, that was, that was a lot of great conversation to take in. As an MC, I'm supposed to usually summarize a panel, but I don't know, I was taking notes and I kept getting longer and longer and longer, and I, to be honest, that was amazing. So thank you, Michelle, Sunita, Rosanna, Susan, Napra, and Arnaud for starting off our morning with amazing conversations about gender equality, about how each tech company has been so forward thinking, but in their own ways. And just kind of sharing with us your personal stories, your challenges, and your own words of wisdom at the end. So thank you so much again.